So we want to carry on thinking about the functions of the liver. And the liver's got quite a few functions in relation to nutrients. So the storage of nutrients and there's metabolic processing of a wide variety of nutrients. And the first one I want to think about is carbohydrate metabolism. So the liver is very involved in carbohydrate metabolism. And the first one I want to think about is, we've partly looked at this before, but if you've seen previous videos in this series, you'll recognize this diagram. So here we have the gastrointestinal tract, taking blood directly to the liver via the hepatic portal vein before that blood is finally discharged into the systemic circulation. Now carbohydrates are going to be broken down by digestive processes into simple sugars, monosaccharide units, glucose, fructose and galactose are the three, three monosaccharide units, the galactose coming from uh, milk. And they're going to go through into the liver via the hepatic portal vein. So glucose, fructose and galactose are all going to be arriving in the liver. But the only sugar we want in the blood, the preferred sugar in the blood, is always glucose. So this means that if fructose or galactose arrive in the liver, then the liver will convert those to glucose. So even though fructose and galactose are arriving in the liver, the blood that's actually draining from the liver is going to contain glucose. So glucose is the only monosaccharide that we find in the blood. Now, often at work I talk about blood sugar. It's a bit sloppy. We should really be talking about blood glucose because the sugar in the blood is always going to be the glucose because of this conversion effect as other monosaccharides go through the liver. And going back to the liver itself, um, it, it's going to regulate, help regulate the amount of sugar in the blood. There again, I've said it again, haven't I? I meant the amount of glucose in the blood. So if there's too much glucose in the blood, that's going to be hyperglycemia. If there's not enough glucose in the blood, that's going to be hypoglycemia. And we don't want either of those. We want euglycemia. We want normal levels of glucose. So sometimes we're going to be uh, eating away and lots of sugar is going to come into the blood. Lots of glucose is going to come into the blood. And we're going to get lots of these individual monosaccharide glucose units. And we've got lots of these individual monosaccharide glucose units in the blood. What's that going to do to blood sugar levels? Well, obviously it's going to increase it, but we don't want that. We don't want hyperglycemia. So this will stimulate the pancreas to release insulin. And the insulin will cause the glucose in the liver to be converted to a big long chain polysaccharide called glycogen. Glycogen. And it's a huge long chain molecule. It's a polysaccharide. It's sometimes described as the animal starch. And uh, the, the key thing is that this is less soluble. So the high, highly soluble glucose in the blood will be converted to insoluble glycogen in the liver. And actually this molecule here forms big long strands. So, um, and it's a branching molecule like this. So we get huge strands of this uh, glycogen, this animal starch, this polysaccharide being stored in the liver. About 50,000 glucose molecules can be stored in one large molecule of glycogen which is very good because it means it's stored in the liver just in case we need it and in your liver at the moment if you're an adult 100 to 120 grams of glycogen will be stored in the liver now there's another 400 grams or so of glycogen is stored in the muscles of the body so the the, the skeletal muscles particularly are also going to be storing uh, storing glycogen in the muscles. The concentration of glycogen in the muscles is less than in the liver, but because overall there's much more muscle mass than there is liver mass, about 400 grams are going to be stored in the skeletal muscles. And this is good because it means if we run short on food 
and we don't get any food for a period of time, then we've got spare carbohydrate here in the liver. And if the blood sugar levels drop, that's going to be detected in the pancreas. And the pancreas is going to produce glucagon from the alpha cells in the pancreatic islets. And the glucagon will cause the breakdown of this stored glycogen back into the soluble glucose units to maintain blood sugar levels. And that'll come from the muscles and, and from the liver. And in fact, this is quite interesting, really, because already we've seen something fairly fundamental. The liver is building small molecules up into larger molecules. And that is called an anabolic process. So when the glucose is converted into this larger molecule, maybe 50,000 units of glucose in this large molecule of glycogen, that is an anabolic effect. That is anabolism, building up. But we also notice that when it's needed, the large molecule is broken down into smaller molecules. And when we break down a large molecule into smaller molecules, that's called catabolism. This is a catabolic effect. And we'll see this in the liver from time to time, that there's going to be anabolic reactions and there's going to be catabolic reactions. So the catabolism of the glycogen to glucose is going to maintain blood sugar levels, blood glucose levels. And uh, this is called gluconeolysis. So the lysis refers to the breaking up of the glycogen molecule to release the free glucose. Gluconeolysis. And this, of course, is absolutely vital because the brain, for example, the brain is what we call an obligate glucose user. It must have glucose in order to function. So, like me, you've probably been in a clinical situation where you've seen a patient who is in a very low state of consciousness and confused because they are hypoglycemic, because the brain is an obligate glucose user. And if the levels of glucose in the blood are too low, the brain is not going to have any glucose to act as a metabolic substrate. Therefore, the brain can't make energy. Therefore, it will stop working and the person will become confused. And the problem with this is that the hypoglycemia prevents normal brain function. So the person can't cognitively process properly. So even though they're hypoglycemic and still conscious, very often they can't think, oh, I'm a bit hypoglycemic. I better take some sugar on board. Um, very often they don't realize that. Now they can do in the early stages, but later on they can become confused. So we have to recognize this and we have to give them some glucose to bring their blood sugars back up again. Or several times in the accident and emergency situation, I've had to give patients intravenous glucose or dextrose because they've become unconscious as a result of an acute hypoglycemia. In my experience, always caused by uh, an accidental or an intentional overdose of insulin. And we'll give them some intravenous glucose or intravenous dextrose to get this back up quickly. And they do wake up very quickly when you do this. As long as you give it early enough, you don't want to leave it too long. And in the first aid situation at home, many patients who are on insulin and take, um, who take insulin will keep some glucagon in the fridge. Because as we know, glucagon will break down the glycogen, which is stored into the soluble units of glucose. Uh, that will work more slowly than giving it intravenously. So in, in the accidents and emergency situation, we'll give it intravenously because it's quicker. But in the home situation where intravenous therapy is not going to be available, intramuscular glucagon to facilitate this catabolic reaction is uh, potentially a life-saving intervention. Now, if we stop eating for a few days, maybe 48 hours, if food's not available in a, in a famine or fasting situation, then we still need glucose in the blood for the brain to use. Now, the brain can adapt to other things, but it does take it an awful long time. So um, we're talking weeks here to adapt to using ketones. So in the short term, it definitely needs uh, glucose. And yet, after a few days, the glycogen reserves 
because we've had no fresh food we haven't been able to eat and the glycogen reserves the 100 or 120 grams from the liver and the 400 grams from the muscle will be used up so we've got a problem now because we haven't got any we're running out of glucose in the blood but with no glycogen to catabolically break down to maintain blood sugar levels so in this situation when the blood sugar levels drop again glucagon will be released and glucagon will stimulate another process in the liver and that process will make glucose from none carbohydrate sources so the liver is able to make glucose molecules to release to maintain blood sugar levels from other substrates like proteins and fats and that process is called gluconeogenesis so gluconeogenesis is producing glucose from non-carbohydrate sources and the liver is able to carry out that biochemical process which of course is absolutely life-saving if we are deprived of food for a few days and this process can go on for many weeks and months until the muscle and the fat stores of the body run out now the other thing that's interesting about the stored glycogen is that glycogen attracts water so for every gram of stored glycogen it's going to osmotically retain in the body about three grams of water so that means if we stop eating for a short period of time say 24 hours 48 hours then the glycogen is going to be used up and as the glycogen is used up the water is no longer osmotically kept in the body to such a degree so for every gram of um, glycogen that's used up the body can excrete or will excrete three grams of water so that means that weight loss is rapid during the first 24 to 48 hours of fasting but this is mostly due to the reduction in the amount of water in the body rather than a, a genuine weight loss phenomena now once the liver is full of glycogen in the storage situation if we've had plenty of food for a period of time then the liver will take this stored glycogen and will convert it into fatty acids for longer term storage so the liver can also produce fatty acids fats for longer term storage these can then be exported from the liver and stored in various places in the body such as subcutaneously particularly in women they store a lot of fat in the subcutaneous adipose tissue or in men unfortunately we tend to store quite a lot of our fat in the abdomen as you might have noticed in some of the middle-aged men that you know the abdomen starts uh, enlarging as adipose tissue is deposited within the abdominal cavity and in the abdominal subcutaneous tissue so that brings us on quite nicely to another function of the liver still related to uh, nutrients but now related to fat metabolism how the liver deals with fats so let's think about this situation now so here we have the liver again and the liver is involved in fat metabolism 